Okay, welcome everyone to our monthly colloquium series. I'm really, really uh, proud to have with us today Professor Jerry Sussman, the uh, Matsushita Professor of Electrical Engineering from MIT. I first met Jerry about uh, just the beginning of this year when we had our first uh, kind of a faculty party, and I proceeded to spend the whole dinner uh, monopolizing conversation, ignoring everybody else who was trying to talk to me because I was having such a fascinating conversation and learning so much. And I'm sure that you'll have a similar experience today. Jerry's won the ACM Outstanding Education Edu Educator Award. Uh, how many years ago was that? Uh, 1990. 1990, uh, which is a very prestigious award. And he's really one of the pioneers of computer science education in something that you probably have very dear to your heart. He is indirectly, if not directly, responsible for all those many hours of programming you did in uh, our course on uh, SICP. <laughs> and he's also the, uh, did you invent scheme, co-author? Yeah, well, with my friend uh, Guy Steele, Guy who Steel. was, was my student at the time, yeah. So, uh, so you have the legacy that he's introduced the computer science of computer science education beginning with that, you've had that experience. And today, Jerry's gonna talk about the general legacy of computer science. Is it a science? Is it a way of thinking? I will let you explain. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> in 1961, when I was a freshman in high school, I went to a little program at Columbia University <clears throat> um, for high school students that was taught by Joel Moses, who ended up being the provost at MIT a few years ago. Uh, so I've known him for since I was a little kid. Uh, and so I've been programming for a long time. You know, almost every possible kind of language or things like that. And every so often you have to feel, gee, uh, what is it that we've accomplished over the past approximately half century? This is the, the technologists, us technologists, who've sort of produced a world that, I mean, indirectly, I don't produce a lot, a little tiny bit of it, but there are a lot of us who produced a world that you are now living in. And um, uh, I decided that... Uh, what we've sort of accomplished is much more, has very little to do with computers. Okay? And in fact, it has also not all that much to do with, with machinery or uh, electronics or things like that. That's, that's the short-term goal. Um, think of it this way. A few thousand years ago, 5,000 years ago, <clears throat> there, was, uh, uh, there were people who lived in ancient Egypt. Okay? And they, what they did was they invented means of measuring the earth because they had to re replant their fields every year after the, the Nile River overflowed and they had to uh, figure out when in fact their, uh, that was going to happen so they had to invent astronomy and things like that and this was done in many places in the world but we know about Egypt and what's interesting about that, that time is that those people didn't think of themselves probably as, as so doing something very important or very large they were thought, although eventually there was a priestly cult built around them, just like around computer hackers. Okay, there's a priestly <laughs> cult. But uh, what what they were doing was, you know, they might think of themselves as surveying instrument scientists or something like that, right? That's what they were doing. And at the at, what we're thinking now is, what is it that could possibly be the legacy that's analogous to that legacy uh, that you might see a few, a few hundred years from now? And, of course, it's fun to talk about what ha might happen a few hundred years from now because no one could contradict me about it. Uh, so I'm not worried about it. Okay, so, so first of all, I'm going to argue that computer science is not a science in the same sense as other sciences. And it's not much about, uh, it's not all that much about, about computers. What it's really about is a new way to explain ourselves, a new way to express what we do and how we do it. Okay, and that's just like various kinds of mathematical things that have existed in the past. Okay? And I, I put up a, a particular, this is an ancient paper. This is written probably when I first started programming computers in 1961. The paper by Marvin Minsky, uh, one of the smartest people I ever met. And the important part of this quote is, in fact, the name of the paper. Why, computer program, why programming is a good medium for expressing poorly understood and sloppily formulated ideas. And so that's really what I want to talk about today. Okay? So, so I'm going to try to show you that this is a revolution in the way we think, and it's sort of a revolution in the class, amazingly enough, 
of the revolution produced by Gutenberg. Okay. Now, let's just go along with this this stuff going on from the ancient history. Uh, just after, I suppose, or around the same time as the ancient Egyptians doing their work, uh, people from Greece p- uh, picked up some of this, and there were people like Pythagoras and Eudoxus and uh, and Euclid, and what they did is they they took the people that the people in ancient Egypt discovered and turned it into an axiomatic la- they invented axiomatic language for describing it. They invented the mathematics we call geometry, which of course is earth measurement. Okay. Now this is a major intellectual tra- uh, transformation. It's a consequence of what those people did that little kids now are smarter than they were then. And what I mean by smarter is very simple. If I were to tell a little kid well, if you build it out of triangles, it won't collapse. But if you make it out of rectangles, if you push, then it collapses. A little kid can understand that. It's because of the words invented by those people. It's because of the language they invented. It's because of the ways of thinking they invented. And that's what's, that was a very powerful thing invented at that time. You know, and indeed, something else like that has happened just more recently. Uh, after, after Euclid and, and people like that, then there were people who did, started inventing algebra. Actually, the earliest algebraic text, which I suppose I refer to in our book that you've read, is the Rhine Papyrus from Egypt, which is, I suppose, written in uh, 1650 BC approximately, and it's a pile of it's a pile of of problems, algebraic problems. You know, Joe is twice as big as Harry was when Harry was whatever that sort of thing. Um, and we, there's the first document in history that, that we know describes algebraic problems. There was, again, a bunch of Greeks later who made this more formal. Uh, Diophantus uh, wrote a book about these ideas, which unfortunately is lost. Uh, then there was a uh, later uh, algebra was developed by an Arab fellow, in fact, a large number of Arabs. Uh, there was an important one by the name of Abu Abd Allah ibn Musa al Kurwizmi, who lived actually quite recently, 780 to 850. That's quite recently in history. And algebra, it was a word he invented, it means the recombining of broken parts in Arabic. It's a precise language that gives us the ability to express relationships among things that we don't know what they are yet. So we can make deductions about things that we're not sure what they particular things are. Okay, whatever this X is that we're talking about, here are various properties of it. And here are things we can deduce about it, and stuff like that. Uh, even more recently, and it's getting pretty, pretty recent, uh, there are people, uh, Galileo, Newton, I suppose Leibniz, um, Descartes. There's a whole crew of those around 350 years ago to 400 years ago. And they were, some of those people were, they were inventing a new language. That language is continuous variables in calculus. Right? But what they were really interested in was, was celestial mechanics. They were trying to understand what was going on with the motion of the planets. There were, um, uh, uh, previously to their, their invention of this, there was sort of a theory that was true in the sense that it got the right answer. Okay? There, was, there was Ptolemy's Almagest, a, a famous compendium of astronomical knowledge where you could predict eclipses based on epicycles and things like that. And you get the right answer, but it, it, was lacking in, it was lacking in some feeling of, well, gee, I understand what's going on, which was, inve- which was fixed by Newton, ultimately, but with the help of all those previous generations of people working on things. Um, that's another great invention, which means that now, as a consequence of that, little kids know things like, well, you know, if the car runs into the tree at 30 miles an hour, that's worse than 25. Okay? That's very important. You see, it's kinetic energy. It goes as the square of the velocity. That doesn't, the little kid doesn't know that, but at least the words, 25 miles per hour, are invented by those people. That's a remarkable phenomenon. So, the claim I'm making is that in each of these cases, there was an advance in human intelligence. Okay? As a consequence of the formalization of what was previously informal knowledge that some people could have but couldn't communicate to anybody else, that some people sort of understood what happened when you threw a ball and other people didn't, but they all could throw balls. Okay, but the, the idea of being able to tell somebody exactly what's going on and being able to communicate that 
that's a way by which human intelligence as a whole improves. And I'm claiming that what happened as a consequence of, of the computational revolution we're in now is exactly the same thing. That computers are invented for the same reasons that all the other technologies get invented, a mixture of economic and military. Okay? Somebody wants to blow somebody else up better. That's one thing that uh, computers are good for. Or want to figure out some way to cheat somebody else in the stock market better. Okay, or whatever. And that's, so there are all these sort of, all these um, methods of, the sort of practical necessity that people invent things for. But then those things take on a life of their own. Sometimes somebody understands a little bit more about what's going on there and invents language. Language gets invented around these things. There's jargon first of the people who use such things, and then it turns into something a little bit more formal, a little bit more formal, and later you call it mathematics. And then a thousand years later, it becomes something that everybody understands as something very intuitive and natural. Okay? And that's sort of making people smarter. And I think we're in the middle of that kind of a revolution. Now, you know exactly what this revolution is. Okay? Because you've seen this example. It was the most Im immediate example in the class that you took. But I'm just going to repeat it just for the heck of it. Okay? And this is it. This is the what is true slide. Okay? That is that up till now we've been very good at for the we've been very good at saying things like this. Although not extremely good. We've only been it's only been a million years since our grandparents were swinging through trees and eating bananas. So it's amazing that we're all sitting here not clawing at each other. Okay? Although there are places in the world where people do that. Luckily, uh, this is not one of those places. The um you know, but there's other kinds of knowledge, which is this kind of knowledge, which is what we've been learning about over the past, say, 50 years or 100 years. Uh, this algorithm, of course, is very old. It's Hero. Uh, it's a Hero of Alexandria. But you see, you could write this down. This is, this is an old algorithm, but you could write down a little one like this, and people could understand it. But it's full of words that are, that are in your natural language that depend upon a very large number of people having agreed over a long time what they mean and some they're, they're a little fuzzy and not exactly clear. It's not formal. This is the kind of thing you might communicate to somebody in a secret sect or a cult. Okay? C is a pretty good example of a language like this. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I'm speaking. Do you want to wait for questions at the end or do you want people to Anybody want to ask me a question at any time? That's fine. Okay. Right. Uh, this is a I, I, <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, actually it's written down in a here. Wow. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, I always, I always got that here attributed to Hero of Alexandria. And say. Right. Okay. Good. But However. Linguistic examples before as a way to show the transference of, of a new state of knowledge of yes. society. Do, do you think that that, that linguistic uh, idea that you brought up is just a byproduct, a way to show that? The no, that's exactly the essence of the matter. Okay. That increasing our ability to express ourselves. So, so the abstraction okay. linguistically is exactly. The it's point. Right, exactly right. Okay. And now, you know, as you say, even though, I, even though I don't much like C, we have languages like this and C where it's possible to precisely describe okay, something like that. Now, the important thing about this is not that the language, who cares what the parentheses are and things like that. What's really, you know, what's, what's important is that it's precise. That is a dumb computer can understand it. Okay? And, of course, C is similarly, it takes a slightly smarter computer to understand C, okay? but not very much. Well, of course it does. Because of, you're looking at me with this funny look. Of course it does, because you have to parse it, for example. This doesn't need even parsing. But the, but the, the point is this is precise enough so that there's, it's all self-contained. There's nothing missing. You can tell exactly what is to be done to get this job done. And so we can express uh, algorithms now, and we can express them in a precise way. Now, it's not like, it's not like that's a big deal, because, of course, we always could. But what happens when you have something complicated? Say it's 100 pages long. Okay? That no one could do until a, a few years ago. So what I'm really trying to tell you about is that computation is providing us with a new tool to express ourselves that has to have an impact in education. 
and that's where the first place you're going to see this, is education, but not education from the point of view of teaching machines and dumb things like that, but rather in the way we actually talk. Let me get out some chalk and do an example here. How many here are, are, are knowledgeable about electrical engineering? How many people here? Okay. How many people are not? Okay. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you a, I'm going to tell you about electrical engineering for a few minutes. Okay. What I'm going to show you is a, I'm going to show you something that you're going to be sort of astonished that you can understand it. <laughs> okay. What do we do in an introductory electrical engineering class? The first thing. Well, you've all probably all had some sort of physics in high school or something. There are things, you know, we have abstractions like pieces of machinery. Okay. These little parts, we call them, or components or whatever. And they have, you know, the little box with wires going into it. And there are laws that describe certain variables that are on them. You don't care what they are. I'm not trying to, to you don't, nothing here. There's not going to be a quiz on the electrical circuit part of this. Okay. But there are things that are two terminal devices. We're characterizing them in terms of things called, called potentials and voltages, which are differences of them, and currents, which are flows. And there are various kinds like resistors and capacitors and, and uh, things like that, okay, which is an example of two-terminal device. There are three terminal devices, and they have funny kind of characteristics, and they're full of equations, okay, and you know, sometimes the equations are so hard you can't write them down except by exponentials, which are impossible to manipulate, and all that sort of thing. And then there are ways you put these together to make complicated things from simple things. You, and you, the means of combination is something called Kirchhoff's laws, which say that certain kinds of stuff called current is conserved. And if you walk around a loop, then the voltages add up to zero, and that means that energy is conserved. That's what basically is going on. Okay? So we show students things like this. You know? And then we give them lots of little examples, and then we try, we try to draw little circuits, which are combinations of these things, and have the students try to work them out. And how are they supposed to figure out how to work them out? Well, they watch us do it on the blackboard, and meaning the teachers. And they're supposed to induce from the example the method, the induction of the method from the example. Now, it gets very hard. Okay? Traditionally, that's a almost impossible thing to do. I'll actually, I'll leave this up for a minute. But I'll, and, you know, a lot of students have a lot of trouble with that, and not, that's not, not surprising. So, for example, if I were to walk up to here to some introductory class in electrical engineering and draw something like this, I want you to see the, uh, the, the form of what I'm writing here or doing. So here's a stupid little amplifier that might occur in a lo-fi system, All right? meaning like a little pocket radio or something. This might be the, the, an amplifier that exists in a, the, for, for audio amplifier in such a system. Okay, there, there it is. Okay? This is a power, plus 15 volts, minus 15, I don't know, something like that. Okay, supposing I have, supposing I, I, I show a student something like this, and it's just the end of a for introductory class in electrical engineering. It's perfectly justified in shooting me. Okay? Because it's impossible to solve, whoops, it's impossible to solve with what I told them. Okay? That is, I don't mean impossible in principle, but it's impossible practically. Right? What they have is uh, four things with exponential equations in them, lots of equations. There's uh, too many to write down. A person could spend all week uh, sitting there crunching these equations. Eventually, if they were good mathematicians, they could get some answers. Right? But what does a real engineer do? A real engineer doesn't do that. And an engineer does says, hmm, mm, this is a, I see that this is a par apparently by a pattern recognition process of some sort, a four transistor bad amplifier. Um, it's you got a Darlington input stage and a common emitter stage and a and a uh, common uh, collector. Uh, there's what, just watch the words and the way I'm thinking. Okay, it doesn't matter what these mean. Okay, and I'll do a DC bias analysis. Gee, I know the voltage here and I know the voltage here. There's no current going into here because this is an active linear transistor. So therefore, uh, and there's no current going into here for DC bias because the capacitor. So this, the voltage divider tells me the voltage here. Voltage here is 0.6 volts below that, and the voltage over here is 0.6 volts below that. Therefore, I know the voltage over here. So I know the voltage across this resistor, so I know the current through it. That current must be coming through this resistor because it can't be coming this way, and it can't be going that way, and it can't be going that way because it would have to go this way. Okay? So therefore, I know the current through this resistor, so I know the voltage over here because of this one's given, and therefore, I know the voltage over here. Okay? And as a consequence, I know the voltage here is 0.6 volts below that. These are two resistors in series in this condition, so I know the voltage... Uh, cross it, and there, therefore I know the current through it, so that current must be coming through here. Therefore I know the voltage here, because I know the voltage here, and I can subtract. And therefore I know the voltage over here, and I know the current through here, so I know all the DC bias conditions. 
Right? That's an example. Right? Very important. I want, a, I want a student to be able to think that way. Not, but, the, but that's not the node method that you teach the students. The node method is something very general, you know, that's a, how you write down all the equations and then how you organize them in such a way to solve them in some sequence that, that makes it gets an answer. It was really hard. Okay? Certainly you couldn't do it for this case unless you were a computer. But what I just showed you is, in fact, you don't have to do that. There's other ways to think. Okay? But that algorithm is hard. That, uh, that algorithm cannot fit in a page of English text. The node method can fit in a page of English text. That's why we teach the node method. Okay? That's terrible. But so the students have to learn the node method and watch me do things like I just did. Okay? And then they have to figure out how to induce from my behavior the program that's supposed to run in their heads okay? that, they should do, that they can do it too, even though what I taught them explicitly was just the laws of nature that enable me to do what I did, not, but not how I did it. And that's what I mean by how to rather than what is. Now, it turns out that a program that could do what I just did there, written in a modern computer language, is about five pages of code. It's not bad. Okay? And what am I actually doing? I was doing something very simple. Okay? I was looking... I was, one thing I was doing is I was... I was, first of all, I separated this into two different kinds of conditions. This was a DC bias analysis. We could do an incremental analysis, too, and you wouldn't care. Okay? But what I'm doing is I'm looking at things a little bit at a time. It's as if I'm looking at things through a tube, and I'm seeing certain, certain regions that I know less something about, and I'm using the blackboard or whatever is my paper as my memory. And what I'm really doing is writing down things and then, use, and then adding things. I'm annotating. And as the, each annotation makes other things, annotations possible. That propagates around those annotations, and so examples of those rules look something like this. I don't mean them in a formal way. Here's an informal set of rules. Uh, here's simple ones for resistors that that you really need to be able to, to to see when you're doing this kind of thing. And so what you've got here is well, if I know the resistance of a resistor and I know the voltage across it, then I can deduce the current through it. And I can, I can add this annotation to the diagram. Or if I see the current and I, and I know the resistance, I can add the voltage. Or if I know the voltage and current, I can put the resistance down. Okay? And if I have something like this, and I know this happens to be zero current here, then I can compute these, the, 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 those ratios. Right? It's a voltage divider and things like that. Okay? And so I have these little things that are very local that I put together and, of course, that may not completely work. I have to worry about if there's feedback, I have to add a variable. I might have one equation okay, for each loop if I'm really in trouble. Okay, but in general, I don't have to do that because most circuits are designed by people, who can, and people can only think certain amounts. There's a limit to how you could think. And so the, the program that the, the designer ran in inventing it has got to be something connected to the program I have to understand, use in understanding it. And so that math puts a limit on how hard it is, okay, even for the very complicated things. Okay, so that's an example of a way by which expression, of course, I'm sure all of you know how, could write a little rule-based system that could then do this sort of thing now. <clears throat> I'm not worried about that. So you see, the crucial thing is if I can assume that if my students are literate in some computer language, Okay. Hopefully an easy one like Scheme, but it could be a hard one. Okay? But if they're li where they have to worry about things like declarations and syntax and stuff like that. But if they're literate in some computer language, then I can express things I couldn't express without that. And in particular, I can take the method I use for solving hard problems, put it into a program, which I can then pass out to the students. They can read it, and then it's, and instead of inducing from my behavior and examples, they can see the general case and then learn how to do it by that method. Now, a lot of you have funny looks on your faces, so there must be some questions there before I go on. Apparently not. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, good. <clears throat> Uh, 
I can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's very difficult to figure out how to analyze the circuit by looking at the computer program. No, I didn't say that. That's, you don't look at the computer program to see how to analyze this circuit. What I'm saying is that the method I used, which was a sort of a propagation method, can be represented as a very simple computer program which you could read. If you read the program, you would be able to, you would be able to obtain a description in your mind of what I do, such that you should then be able to do it too in the same way. It's a way of communicating the method I do used, not the particulars of this per circuit. The particulars of this circuit is not interesting at all. Okay? I mean, there are 42 different circuits, all of which you know you could analyze by almost the same method. So it's a generalization. Is that helpful? I just wonder if the language is, the computer language is well, I didn't, didn't notice I didn't use actually any to show you one, I, but, but that's it. But it is rather easy. It's five, look, five pages of, of something which is formal and precise is a lot easier than 150 pages of English text uh, attempting to describe that process in badly. Okay? Now, you may want to take that five pages and annotate it with 10 pages of well-written English text that's less, that's less <laughs> explicit. Okay, well, that's the same, but that's a much better thing. <clears throat> of course, you can't replace the kinds of knowledge. I'm not replacing one kind of knowledge with another. There's a way to add, to, to express a kind of knowledge we never could express before. Okay? We could only do it by example. Okay? That's, that's the difference. <clears throat> so yes? It's, it's basically a kind of language in itself, like the first writing might have been where yeah. I can see the, the notation of what you said, and I might not be able to say it in the same way, but I can still right. say it to myself. Well, most of us can read, when we read, um, if you read a piece of text, it's very rare that people read literally. You know, if I've got, if I, if I, I'm terrible at reading out loud. I can read, I read, if I try to read something out loud, what happens is I give you a paraphrase. Right? It's just impo almost impossible for me to be explicit. I'd be a terrible actor in that way. And uh, as far as I can tell, um, that that's, that that's exactly what I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping when I transfer or give someone a program that I'm giving them something that they can read and then there's a paraphrase that they make up that's in their heads. Okay? And that's, that's the way I think about it. Now, now, this idea of computer programs as a language for expressing ideas. Uh, we wrote that down, of course, in the introduction to our book, which you all have. But an interesting thing uh, happening there is it turns out this is getting into the common culture. People are beginning to understand this. Uh, here's a rather remarkable case. It appeared in a court case, would you believe? I actually don't know what this court case was about. Uh, my friend Hal Abelson, who keeps up with, with legal business, knows what it's about. But there was a, a fellow by the name of Ber Bernstein who got into a fight with the U.S. Department of State, presumably over something having to do with, with export of computer programs. I have no idea. And the, uh, the, the uh, one of the piece of evidence by the plaintiff, him, uh, was in fact a quote from our book that programming is not, as the defendants would have it, merely mechanical. It is both an art and a science. A computer program is not just a way of getting a computer to perform operations, but rather it is a novel, the formal medium for expressing ideas about methodology. Nice thing. This is actual from the, from this, from out, of a, out of a case. Okay? Uh, the plaintiff won. Okay, and uh, I'm pleased to say that. But it really feels nice when you see something like this in a um, in getting into the popular culture. And furthermore, it survived appeal. Uh, here's the uh, uh, guy, guy. <laughs> so, and not only that, the Department of Justice got got shafted in this case too. Okay, so he won on that one as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a. So what, I, what I've been doing for a long time, almost, let's say, for probably, I would say, most of my life, certainly starting from the time I, I got a Ph.D. in 1973 at MIT till, till now, what I've been doing is thinking about how to express knowledge in a way that I could give to other people to read. Okay? And that's very, it's, it's, the, it's been the most important thing. I really think that education is the crucial thing we do. And I'm, uh, research is a perk that a good educator should be allowed. That's just a personal, a personal gripe about the system. But the, the interesting thing is that if you come up with a new way of expressing things, it is research. Okay? And very often the right thing. So, 
So, there are, so the fact that no one had written programs like this before had actually been considered a big deal at the time. Now I'm going to talk to you about, you might say, well, Gina, you just let me do something very, an analytic type thing, right? Here's an analytic description of a, of a process, uh, very, uh, you know, it's already been specified what the problem is. But supposing I have something that's harder. Okay, now I'm going to again use it as something from electrical engineering because that's what I tend to teach a lot of. Okay, I'll use an example. But again, it doesn't matter the details. What I'm going to show you is a design, which goes the other way. That's analysis is, given that you have a configuration of things and the laws by which the things behave, to deduce the behavior of the composite from the behaviors of the parts and the ways they're interconnected. That's what analysis is. However, there's another branch of the thing called synthesis, which says, I got a pile of junk, and I've got a requirement, and I want to make a box out of this pile of junk that meets this requirement. That's the creative end of, of, of doing something like engineering. And I'm going to show you a very simple example where computer programming is absolutely essential to communicate the ideas of design. It turns out that no one teaches design. They assume that, or at least almost no one teaches design, because they assume that's too hard. The only way you learn design is by doing lots of examples. And see, that's a, there's not even, you can't write down algorithms like the node method for solving the, the cases mathematically for design. So let me give you another, another little problem here. <clears throat> and I'm sorry for using electrical engineering metaphors so much, but I think it doesn't matter very much because, because all of these things are the same in, in every subject. And, uh, you know, poets do the same thing with poetry. And I'm, I'm sure you'll see that. And uh, musicians do the same thing when they compose music. It that doesn't quite work. I have to fit it together slightly differently. You know, you have to, have to smooth out the edges where the, there's a little bit of a problem. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. But in any case, supposing I want to, here's a, here's a, sometimes you need a box called a filter. A filter. So in goes something called the signal and out comes a signal. Okay, and the silicon has some change in, in, in behavior. And in particular, I want this filter to have a particular frequency response, it's called, which looks like this. As so I wanted to, to, I wanted to give me, if this is for the telephone, say, I wanted to start, give me a uh, speech between 200 hertz and 2 kilohertz, or 3 kilohertz, and I want to cut out everything else because I don't want 60 cycle line current to get into the, uh, into the system. I don't want, uh, signaling frequencies to get in. Okay, so I want to make something like that. Okay, a box. Now, that's a hard problem. It's not a really hard problem. I know the answer, but it's a hard problem in the sense that, in the sense that if I were again a student beginning in electrical engineering, I have to think of really hard about this. Let's figure out how I would do it as a young student. Well, the problem is this doesn't have any. This this picture I drew doesn't have any discrete properties. Okay, it's not it's not made out of individual pieces. A curve. I just got a curve. Okay. But the curve does have some interesting properties. It does have uh, places which are breakpoints where it changes its behavior. Okay, that's an important thing to realize. So I'll call them two frequencies, omega one and omega two. Uh, it seems to start out at zero, okay? And there happens to be some laws of nature which we do mathematically. We say, oh, things like that, and maybe I could draw them in the complex frequency domain. They look like that. So I've got discrete features called poles and zeros, okay? Which means that. This thing's got a box that happens to have some, some particular ratio of polynomials, okay, which is its behavior. The reason why I'm, I'm saying these words is because those things have to be discrete. They have made something that's sort of a, made out of some smooth, hard to understand thing into something which has got particular features like, gee, I could talk about the distance between two people, somebody's eyes when trying to recognize their face, or I could talk about the size of the nose, or things like that, which are specific things, rather than, well, it's some gestalt. Okay? Now, it turns out that most people who are playing with circuits have a library of ways of implementing various discrete features. So if I need to make something that looks like this, okay, I can do it by something that looks like this. I just happen to know that. It's in my library. Okay? And if I want to make something that looks like this, say, okay, I can make it by doing by something that looks like this. Oops, excuse me. Okay, there. Okay? And there's some laws of how you can combine things. 
that say, well, if I want to make something which is the product of these two, I can hook them up one after another. Okay? So I hook them up in some funny way. And that's a kind of a way of composing things, which turns out doesn't quite work. Okay, but that's good, because we don't have to debug it. So I'm sort of giving you a feeling for what design is like, as I happen to know some those two methods of making the various parts. Okay? And the reason why it doesn't work is, well, now I've got to debugging. Debugging. And debugging means, why didn't this work? This part works, and this part works, but when they hook together, they don't work. And the reason why is because the assumptions under which this was designed is that no current came out of here, but the assumptions under which this design it was designed is that there was a voltage source here that could push any amount of current it pleased that way. It's called loading. The name of the bug, it has a name. Bugs have names, like fence post error. You know, fence post error is in programming, right? How many fence posts are there? I'm going to show you a little bit of a design sequence. Let's see if this, so here is it, how does this work? I'm going to give this, this is a name. The name for this is problem solving by debugging almost right plans. Okay? It's, called, it's, it's when you're really, if you're stuck, what you have to do is take a jump in some direction, you dig yourself into a hole and you have to dig yourself out. Okay? And this is a, but you have to have some idea of how to get closer to the goal. So for, if just showing the thing I just said, here's, this, here's the real specification. Okay? That, you know, I've got something that has some, I need a box that has certain behavior. Okay? And I know that I can turn this into discrete features that looks like that. That's something I've been taught. Okay? And I know certain rules by which things can be combined. Here are rules. If I want to make something that's a product, I can make it out of the product by connecting things together like this, or I can make a sum by doing things like this. You don't have to know what these mean. Okay? It says box that does this and box that does this hooked up in this way makes a box, a bo an abstract box that does this. Okay? That's basically that's basically sort of rules. So I might decide what I really want to do is this, but this doesn't work. Okay? Okay? That's that's important. So what are these things? These ideas, a lot of these come right out of programming. First of all, I can write a little program. I'm going to write it in English. I'm not going to write the program in a computer language because it's too hard for a day. It will not fit on a blackboard. Okay, it'll fit on, it's to say something I might talk about in a class of design, on design that might take three or four weeks to, to go through. But given I've got a problem to solve, do I know the answer? If so, I'm done. If not, can I split the problem into pieces by some known decomposition? In this case, I couldn't. So, but can I change the representation of the problem on a 100 uh, meter fence with a uh, post every meter? 101. The error is called, there's a fence post error if you said 100. Okay? You have names for every, when you have the name of a spirit, you have power over it. <laughs> As every sorcerer will tell you. So, this is called a loading bug that I just have here. And if I know that bug and I can teach people about that bug, then I can teach them that the right thing to do is to patch that bug with an amplifier, and then that looks like that. And that does work. Who cares what these things mean? I'm not interested in making you into electrical engineers. The important thing is that this is the classical patch for a loading bug. Yes, I did. I turned it into a pole zero diagram rather than a uh, uh, frequency response. Okay? Then I go back and solve the problem with a new representation. Do I, no, I didn't know the answer. Can I split the problem into subproblems by a known decomposition? This time, yes. There was ways of making products and sums, because I could do that with polynomials, which is what, well, ratios of polynomials, which is what those pole zero diagrams are. Uh, if so, I solve each of the subproblems, construct a particular solution to the, each of the whole from the solutions of the parts, then put it together. Test that the composite result, does it actually solve the problem? If so, I'm done. If not, I have to describe the difference between the behavior obtained and the behavior I desire. And I, then I have to solve the new subproblem, which is to make a modification to our putative solution that eliminates that difference. Okay? Now, just having such a plan makes a kid smarter. I mean, kid meaning 18-year-old in my classes <coughs> in electrical engineering. Okay? It really is true. Just the idea that they've seen that words. They, because most of the time, people sit around and say, gee, you know, the most horrible thing that happens, give out a problem, 
Student can't solve it. So I say, what's on your mind? How do you go about solving a problem? So he says, well, I make my mind a blank. And I'm hoping <laughs> that I'll get an idea. They got this from some guru, right? Some, some, some other, th- some bad theory of, uh, of, of, of mental activity. Okay? But the fact is, what you really want is a plan. And the plan is, you have to have a, sort of a, a library of them and say what kinds of plans fit what things. And this is a general way of pasting together plans. And so you have to know how to accumulate them, make these little libraries, a mental thing. So teaching someone just how to think this way makes them smarter. And you know what? This isn't too hard to write a program to do either. This is basically what's old Newell Simon, logic theorist. You know, lots of AI programs do this sort of thing. They don't work very well. That's fine. A program that works doesn't work very well is far better than a program that doesn't work at all, which has nothing in it, right? So you, this is so it's being and, and most students start out with nothing. Okay? In fact, they always do. Right? And, they, and that's a real problem. So what ideas are contained in things like that? Well, ideas that come from programming that make it possible for us to say things like this. Subproblems are problems to be solved, right? There are solutions to subproblems are combined to construct a solution to the whole. There are search processes that might be alternative paths. I had two different ways of making that decomposition. I chose one. If it didn't work, I would have gone down the other path. Right? So I have to learn how to do that, how to search a tree. Okay? I have to make sure I don't go around in a loop and search the same thing over and over again. You know, how many of you, you have all I've got into that state? I've certainly done it, okay, of getting into some loop where I can work on the same problem and I come back to the place I just was. And you know, I've got to learn how to recognize the loop and catch it and say, oops, that's a failure. Backtrack. Right? So you must be able to evaluate the consequences of a choice, and there must be ways of, of, yeah, of remembering what it is that you did, what depended upon what. And then there are things like rule systems where you have pattern matches, and essentially how you store your libraries. Okay? And say what are the various various uh, antecedents, how they specify best specification to determine the rule applicability, and how those uh, substitute into particular problem specific values. Okay, so that's the that's the kind of thing that I, I want my students to get when they when I when I teach. Now, yes. Sure. No, it would be for speed of communication. Some st- first of all, let's say be careful. Some smart people always can do this. Okay. What you want is every smart person to be able to do it. Okay? And the way, way you do that, that means you have to be able to communicate. 5,000 years ago, there were a few people in ancient Egypt who knew how to measure the land. They turned themselves into, they, they were worshipped. Right? Now, everybody can get a tape measure. Okay? It's a big difference. Okay? And everybody knows, and a few people even still, but many more, know what to do with a transit. Okay? Oh, oh. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, I'm not. I'm not. I, I got a lot more to say here. Uh, it takes a while to shut me up. Uh, but yes, uh, there is a. No, you'll see. First of all, I want to point out that this is not. This is not something purely about science and engineering. Okay. Uh, I have some quotes from some pretty famous humanists, which you'll be somewhat freaked out about. I'm sure. Here's something from Edgar Allan Poe. Have anybody read the, the Philosophy of Composition by Edgar Allan Poe? A marvelous essay. He explains in this essay how he constructed the raven. And the explanation is, the explanation is delicious. He does it by a patchwork. He's got this decomposition of the various, he has a set of specifications for the problem. He decomposes them into various pieces. He makes up parts that, that, that solve the, the individual pieces. He puts them together. They're not quite good enough. He adjusts the interfaces until they come out right. He has to do some global optimization. Okay? He explains this in this marvelous, in this absolutely marvelous essay. Okay? And it's, it, what's amazing is that he was one of the few poets erudite enough to explain what he does. Okay? In fact, there's a nice book, How Does a Poem Mean? I think I can't remember who wrote it. It was a Chardy. 
or it might be Hayakawa, I can't remember which of the two. But there's a nice, a nice book, uh, How Does a Poet Mean, which explains the methods by which a poet uses to construct a particular emotional state in the, in the listener. What are the ways you could choose your words, the way you put them together, and, how, and you can construct such a state. Okay, so this is a, an example. Okay. Um, good old, another nice one. If you know French, but Baudelaire uh, was pretty interested in, 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 in stuff. He was, he was pretty careful about how he built stuff. Okay, and He thought of it as long deliberation with deliberately constructed effects. You know, you, everybody knows this idea that poets sit around and suffer and all that. Okay, and that's sort of a, that's a, a game they play to make them look like they, they're different from everybody, like engineers and mathematicians and other types of people. Okay, but the real answer is that what they do is exactly the same kind of work. In fact, all smart people I know do the same stuff. They just do it about different things. That's really the interesting that Here's how do we teach people to be smart. Okay. I've, one of my best friends is a pianist. He's a pianist in residence at Caltech. He's, uh, he's been there for 25 years, uh, and he's also a, a teacher about uh, of science and music and science and music. He's a concert pianist, a high-class concert pianist. And a wor- his, his favorite way to say is a work of art is a machine with an aesthetic purpose. Okay. Now, people ask why, why, uh, they, they, why we don't know this, why everybody tells us something different. Okay, why is it when you go to school you don't learn that this is the way things work? And it's a matter of, it's a people, some people want the mysticism in their biz, line of business, whatever it is. Okay? It's sort of a job security, they think, perhaps. I, Edgar Allan Poe was pretty, pretty clear about it. It is, again, from the philosophy of, of composition. Yeah, I'll just let you read this nice thing. I'm not even going to say what it is. That it's a, that, that and of course, many computer programmers do the same. How many times have you opened a program and found, guess what this does, monkey? I, mean, I, I found that comment in, in, in code. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, uh, and I've written something like that too. Because when I was a rather immature young fellow, it was, it was considered fun to write programs that nobody else could read. Is it okay if I talk a little longer? Sure. Okay. Um, about 1980, that's a long time ago. It's amazing. It's 20 years. Uh, 1980, I went to the Boston Computer Show, which was in the then the Heinz Auditorium, which no longer exists. There was a uh, you know place where they had exhibitions, and this is when the first times of sort of personal computers of some sort or another came out. And so everybody was there, and every little kid was there taking the parents around. I remember that. <clears throat> And so I was, oh, I saw the most wonderful thing, a 10 megabyte hard drive about so big that it cost only a few thousand bucks, okay? But um, uh, there was a, I, at one point, I, it was completely astonished. There was a little girl, she was probably about nine years old, so it's unlikely anybody here is, is that girl. Uh, <laughs> there was, it was typing at a, quite quickly at a, at a, at a computer, Okay, and her father, or I presume it was her father, was standing stiffly looking at the ceiling next to her like this. Okay, and he was obviously bored as hell. And so this little girl was typing at some little computer, and at some point she grabbed his arm and said, Daddy, Daddy, this computer is very smart. It's basic, knows about recursive definitions. Okay. Now, this is 1980, um, but it was Boston. The... <laughs> okay. <laughs> the the thing that was neat was the way I think of it is the concept of a recursive definition didn't exist 150 years ago. There was people did understand mathematical induction a little bit, not very much. Okay, good mathematicians understood it well. Everybody could do a little bit of it, like adding up the integers or something up to some number. Um, but it was a it was a fairly esoteric idea. 
around 1930, the logicians understood recursion. It was invented by people like Gödel and Church and, um, I suppose, Turing and a whole bunch of the logicians who hung around in the 30s. And they sort of, if it was an esoteric idea, then it was you know, a fancy thing that you would write a book about in, in, in mathematical logic that might be get you, win you a Fields Medal. Okay. Understanding recursion really well. And in 1980, a nine-year-old approximately, I couldn't know a real age, you know, a nine-year-old girl could know it well enough, know this idea well enough to test to see whether or not something had that behavior. Okay. I could appreciate that that was important. And that's what I mean by people being smarter as a consequence of computers. Uh, and I think that it's sort of a pity that we don't have people learning programming now when they're very young. They really ought to be, because it just will make them smarter as a as people. So, so sort of, I get a little, a little bit of a conclusion. Although I'm still working on this, by the way, I don't I don't give up. Now, I can tell you what I'm doing right now, but I'll do it after my conclusion. The conclusion is that we're in the middle of an intellectual revolution. And it's a a really important intellectual revolution, but it has nothing to do with the computers themselves. It's precipitated by computers. The intellectual revolution is a revolution in the way we express ourselves because we now have words that come that are, have come from having invented computation. And we have formal ideas that come from it, like recursion, like bugs in the sense of you know, in the sense of a computer bug, that debu- the process of debugging, we have the idea that I could walk up to somebody and I could have a little conversation that they could act, right? And we all know what that means. The person could act, okay? There could be a, um, a we could patch a, a patch something, okay? There could be, we understand words like that. And that those begin to be part of the language, even though they didn't exist in the language 40 years ago. And when we start inventing new concepts and giving them names, then we all get smarter, Right. So that's really my conclusion. Okay. And uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. And if anybody wants to know what I'm up to now, it's right along this in this path, I'll tell you about it. Yes? So I'm a good programmer. Why am I then not a good poet? That's because it's what you choose to do. So I could be a good poet. I have no doubt that if you learn the techniques, suppose you read a few, a few books like the, the one called How Does a Poem Mean? And you really were interested. You were, you were excited about that. And you built up after you took takes practice too. Look, learning to play chess is not just learning the rules. Twenty minutes I can teach you the rules. To become a master takes you maybe twenty years of hard work. To be a good a good programmer takes twenty years of hard work too. The programmer gives you the ability to understand how to interpret those rules and how to pick up things and, and, and use them to fix yourself when you have bugs. You can introspect on the way you do things and say, I see what I'm doing wrong, and then say, I know how to fix that. And that's something you could do better because you're a programmer than if you weren't. Okay? But I have no doubt that if you really were motivated to be a programmer, you could be. That's not the same thing as physical skills. I don't think you get to be a better tennis player by being a programmer. I'm talking about symbolic skills. Okay? I mean, being a, there's things, some things have to do with adjusting of the parameters. You learn certain certain motions, and that has to do with, well, there's a, a very large number of parameters that run this muscle, and it's very complicated. It's not discrete. It's not made out of discrete features. But things like poetry or engineering or you know, mathematics or theoretical physics. I mean, a theoretical physicist is not much different from a from mystic. Right? <laughs> and so but both people believe that by manipulating symbols, you can extract truth. Right? That's not, not a very big difference. Yes? You're distinguishing between physical uh, things and, and, and symbolic things. You also use this example of chess, and, and that struck me, because uh, mm-hmm. I always use this example of what, what I teach, of a book that I read when I was a kid by Capablanca. Oh, yes, I know the book. One of the greatest chess players ever. Phenomenal. A, a brilliant prodigy. And he writes this book whose introduction basically says, uh, I'm a genius, and I love this stuff, but if you read this book, you've got everything you need to know to be a master, and really as good as me as far as I know. Right. What you get out of reading this book, for the most part, when you're all done with it, at least as a child, uh, when I finished reading it, was he had no idea why he was great. Uh, (laughs) You know, he did know one thing. You had better develop your pieces fast. (laughs) 
Yeah, though he gave some good advice, and, and it was good right. general advice, but, but I don't think anybody who would, who would read that book has, that's right. I don't think he understood what made him as great as he was when he that's was right. five years old and able to kind of glance at a board and have a sense of it. It's and a, there are skills like that sure. which are just not amenable to the kinds of expression that we have, even with... Of course. And, and I think you need another revolution. Oh, that. I think that may be true. This is one step. You know, again, yeah. the, the 2,000 years from now, this will be considered a little tiny step, just like the invention of geometry. Yeah. So I okay. Like, yes, like you're right. Michael could probably yes. be a decent poet. Sure. But I'm not sure that he's going to be. The issue of what makes somebody like a like a great poet, somebody who just gets an instinct and then later on backtracks through. It's hard to be an. What's the look, process of how I got What that. you're saying is it's hard to be Shakespeare. Yeah, okay? it's, it's hard to be introspective. It's hard to know how you do the most creative things. Absolutely. You That's this is a, what you're, you're falling into is what the AI people call the superhuman human fallacy. Okay. <laughs> It's a very famous fallacy. It's because of the fact that you can find things or people that could do certain things specially well. Okay? That means that the method that they're using is something you can't necessarily capture okay, by some ordinary means. We don't know that. What we do know, what we do know is that the ordinary everyday type stuff, like reasonably good poets like Longfellow, we, we could probably, well, it's not so good, right? Okay. But, that's a, but that's what I mean, exactly. If you could be as good as Longfellow, you'd be pretty good, right? It wouldn't be, it would, you're not going to be, you're not going to be Shakespeare without having a certain other thing we don't know how to specify. That's right. Okay, I agree. But that may be another revolution before we can write that down. But I have no doubt eventually we will be able to write that down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Parts that we don't understand yet. Right. Exactly right. The talent is the talent is to a great extent knowledge and exp that we have not yet learned how to formalize, right? And that we, if we could formalize it, we could teach it. Right? And the teaching is the crucial thing. There's, here's a very it's a wonderful difference between the, the there's a difference between the um, the culture of natural scientists and say engineers. Very big difference. Natural scientists believe to a great extent in the talent theory of knowledge. You're born with it or not, and we're going to filter you out and find the ones who are good. Right? And then we're going, to, we're going to turn them into scientists. Okay? And then there's a, the engineer, that's because they're upper class. That's why. I mean, it's a, the, the hereditary theory of everything. They're, you know, they're playing polo. It's kind of, and they, they're very competitive. They go out and kill each other. Right? Go, go meet two biologists who could stand each other. But the, but whereas you, again, take the, take people who are, who are, who are engineers, it's a very different thing. That's from the, from the craft guilds of Europe, okay, where the problem is you're going to build this cathedral. It's going to take 100 years. You're not going to be alive when it's done. But if you're the guild master, you have to train the next one. You have to they train all of the workers who are going to work on, this, on that part of the cathedral. And, and, they have to, and so there's a lot of teaching involved. And the belief, you've got to believe that people can be taught. That's the, that's, that's the skill theory of knowledge rather than the talent theory of knowledge. Okay? As a lower class... But, high, but actually, much more effective way of, of, of running a society in many in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. So when I saw you describing this node method of solving that electrical engineering problem, I mean, immediately the thought came to mind over that, you know, the kind of a recursive idea of how it would be described. Are you, are you saying that, like, I wouldn't have even had that thought had it not been for the language developed out of computation? Yeah, I think that's right. I think nobody, if you go look at an electrical engineering book written, say, you know, up to leave in 1990, okay, what you're going to find, no matter what, is, is two pages of reasonably impenetrable text, mostly about, about equations, okay, and nothing about, nothing about how to go about doing something in an effective way to get the job done. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, so just to, to follow up along that question and along those lines, uh, mm -hmm. I recently worked on, on a medieval algebra book written in the, in the 1300s, which had a lot of inductive ideas, some of the earliest inductive ideas from, from back then. Uh, Leonardo of Pisa? No, the, uh, no, it was a Jewish guy. Oh, so, who was it? Okay. Lady Ben Gershon. Okay. Uh, uh, I was thinking, trying, to get the, trying to get the date right. Time, yeah, okay. I mean, it, it, so, mm -hmm. here's a guy who do a lot of these ideas and he keeps binomial coefficients, recursive relationships, describing everything recursively. Yeah. Uh, certainly did these, these triangle numbers, these sums of cubes, all sure. that kind of thing. But did not notice, this was a genius who didn't have a lot of people to talk to. 
Mm -hmm. right? And he did not formalize these ideas, nor did he make it into any kind of general form of expression. So similar to the way a great poet wouldn't necessarily know, or maybe try to, but not necessarily know what was the key idea, he did not even identify this idea as something unique, as something cool, as something that had a general, not only other applications, but actually as a way of language. That's right. And that took 500 years before, well, 300 more years until Pascal noticed it, and then three or 400 more years until it became high school curriculum. That's right. And, uh, That's exactly what you expect. And indeed, what we're seeing right now is exactly the same thing, right? But we're seeing that, that but things are much more accelerated. Uh, you know, where we're seeing is that in the 1930s, logicians started to formalize a lot of what you call computation now. And in the 1960s or so, people started actually programming, 50s and 60s, and with, with languages, I mean, as opposed to you know, putting ones and zeros on in punch cards. And then... And then uh, but now we're beginning to see it appearing in the 80s, I suppose, appearing in the general culture. Okay? That's because we have better communication. And we have Gutenberg so to solve the problem you know, of communicating, <laughs> at least effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a general kind of the artist type idea, but do you see this stuff kind of having permeated out into sciences more broadly? I mean, because to me, one of the things that about computing and the engineering you've been talking about is dealing with complexity and breaking complexity down and all the rest of it. And I just think of chaos theory. Oh, sure. And the difference between the difference chaos theory is made in physics in terms of dealing with complex real systems and getting away from sure. the kind of Newtonian worlds which don't really exist. Well, no, actually, chaotic the worlds are, are Newtonian worlds are chaotic worlds too. Yeah, um, but I mean, the, the emphasis being on. Well, you know, you know, it's still finding laws. The real question, with the, of course, a lot of people m slightly mix up chaos with unpredictability, which isn't quite true. Chaos is the, exp is the explosion of error, right? Yeah. It's if you, if you have, don't know the error, it's that's right. That's, the, that's right. So that's, that's a technical point. The really difficult problems in me mecha mechanics, for example, which I'm very interested in. I just wrote a book on mechanics. Uh, the really difficult points in mechanics have not much to do with chaos. Although chaos is a tool you use in analyzing systems, it was basically the, the important tool was invented by Poincaré. And the tool was to look at the geometry of the situation rather than to look at the algebraic equations or the, the differential equations that describe it. It's an amazing, amazing breakthrough. But it's at the beginning of the century, and then that slowly turned into what we now think of what you call chaos theory. So that people look at things called Poincaré sections of a system, or they call surfaces of section, and then you can, you see features in it, and the features tell you what's going on. Yes. Well, right in line with that, yeah. going back to the poetry comment, because I myself. Um, so the com a, a complement to a discussion about chaos theory would talk about complexity and about how um, describing a, 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 a mechanical substrate in a very precise but very small range view, uh, doesn't really speak to any kind of emergent behavior or a great behavior. And, and actually, human cognition's limits might be the only fence that, be like the, the, the total fence that we're going to be able to understand, and with, with even greater behaviors like in the world outside of that and on top of that. And the reason why I sound a little misty eyed about that is I think the poetry's the same way. You can talk all you want about, uh, about craft and methodology, and you can definitely find a common thread among all great writers of a, of a very definite... And great engineers. Practice. But, <laughs> but and bringing it back in, do, don't you think it's important in science to have a, some kind of notion of conservation and uh, respect for the open-endedness and perhaps... Uh, like, like, it's one thing to say that you can capture these things in, in a, in a metho methodological oh, way. I'm not, try, I'm not trying to say anything. Oh, I see your problem. I am not trying to say that this solves the world's problems. Got to be careful, okay? Every step is a little step, just like geometry. What it does, it gives you new ways to express yourself, right. which is better than, than, than not having it, okay? Every time we invent a new step, we all get smarter. But there are still always problems that we can't, we can't get our, our, our fingers around, of course. Shouldn't we be very, very worried about, uh, about closing our, our progression as a species oh. cognitively off from... Oh, by, by understanding one thing, we make it hard to understand something else. You're saying by going down one path, we may end up not being able to do something else? To focus very heavily on proceduralism, 
as a way of description and, and perhaps uh-huh. limiting our ability to. All right, I can tell, I can I'll direct. I I I I'm re, re, I can imagine the way people felt when writing was invented. Okay, when writing was invented, there were lots of people who were very upset that the great epic uh, poet ex- uh, poetry reciters who memorized these humongous texts like the Bible. Right. We go around and expound them completely flawlessly. You know, take days to, do, to say this thing. They just had to feed the guy while he would expound this giant text. Okay, those people didn't. They, they were, they were, we're going to lose our ability to have memory. It's, a very right? it's true. You brought that up as the example, though, because you brought up somebody that would memorize and reproduce. You brought up somebody that was yeah. a text producer rather than somebody that was perhaps improvisational. Well, but a different category of. Communication besides wanting to be captured by Well, of course, but all I'm suggesting is that there's, at every stage of the development of the technology, there are people who feel, oh my gosh, because we've adopted this technology, we're going to lose something. Uh, okay? Ethical choices that you're making. I, just I don't know. It's an, it's, look, let's go back there and think about that. Would you rather not have writing and have, and have, to, have to have a few people who can memorize huge texts? Okay? Or go not, more recently. Calculators. Look at the debates in schools about little kids being can they can they do adding? Okay, that's sort of a dumb debate. Adding is is a dumb, uninteresting business. You don't learn anything by that algorithm. Right. What you learn is adding. It does make sense that to say that the sum of two set uh, of the cardinalities of two sets is the cardinality of the of the union. Right. Right. That's a good thing. Right. If they're disjoint. But the, but the point is, understanding that is something I want kids to understand. I don't give a damn whether they know how to do decimal arithmetic, and there are machines that do it real well. Okay, and the world is, be- is the, isn't the world better off now that machines do this real well rather than having little kids learn that stupid algorithm? Except people in stores can't make change. That's a, that's a, that's, that's a bug that has to do with, it's a temporary bug. <laughs> because after all, there won't be people in the stores. Okay. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Any example that you pick is going to be an example where um, these these notoriously picky and, and bitchy people are, are are tired of these innovations because it makes Look. it makes these uh, these thought processes like I still use a personal analog assistant. Okay. <laughs> yes. Like you're exactly right, and I'm, I, I, yeah. I'm mesmerized by your lecture. But I also feel like there's almost like a mental ecology that needs to be preserved, where so many people that are, are educated are using that. Sure. My mother is a math teacher, and she is going to love watching your lecture on, on the internet because that's mm-hmm. what she's always doing. She's uh, she's very worried about um, kids being locked in a procedural view. Of where, course. Where, where this wonder can be captured to the point that they grow up within that and they can't see outside of their time. That's always a danger. Anyway, uh, they're smarter than they are. And but be but the danger, there's always a danger with every time you invent a new way of thinking, that the new way of thinking will capture people enough so that they won't be able to do something else. Right. It, and the real question, it ha- but it really, on the large scale of history, that hasn't happened. It's only it's true that on on five year or ten year time scales things like you see things like that happening all the time, but over over a thousand years, which is the level I, I'm thinking about, things have just gotten better. Right? And, and the reason we've gotten better is because of the fact that we've been able to we've added to the inventory of possible ways to think. Yes, sir. I'd like to hear more about like, the stuff you're working on. Now. Oh, I was actually I was getting close because man was talking about chaos theory and things like that. Although I'm not I'm not doing that, but. One of the, I, I'm, I'm teaching uh, advanced classical mechanics. Okay? This advanced classical mechanics is a, for those of you, who, how many people have had, uh, had any, cl- any mechanics, first of all? Everybody here, right? It's had mechanics. You know, F equals MA, right? Okay, everybody's got to, had that. Then there's, how many of you have ever, don't know what Lagrange's equations are? Okay? How many don't? Okay, good. That's about half. Okay. The, the class... <laughs> The class I'm teaching now starts with Lagrange's equations and goes through something called canonical perturbation theory. So it's an advanced classical mechanics class. And uh, I will wave around a book that just came out, okay, because I'm so proud of it. It just came out, okay? Where is it? Here, I was in this, in this pocket, huh? This pocket. Oh, here it is, okay? 
Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics. Okay? By Jerry Sussman and, and Jack Whitson, a friend of mine. Do you only write books on that one Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I really take offense at books that are heavier than they have to be. Okay? I don't want people to have to carry around more paper than they need to. And I also take offense at books that are, uh, that, that, that are not well printed and things like that. There's a whole bunch of uh, things like that. But in any case, what the, the, let me tell you, tell you what this is about okay, for a, f a few seconds. It, uh, what it is is programmers' view of classical mechanics. And what programmers' view means is that every equation is precise enough such that it could be pro a program could understand it. There is nothing left out. So, for example, for those of you in the know, uh, the laws of nature are written as Lagrange's equations in one form that look like this. D by dt, dl by dq, dot minus dl by dq equals zero. This is, you know, laws of nature. That's how everything moves. Okay. What does it mean? It turns out it's type error. There's no way to interpret this okay, as, as being a consistent piece of, of, of text in any language. Unfortunately, if you open a book in classical mechanics, it's there, just like that. This is Lagrange's equations. The problem is that what Lagrange's equations are is a statement of constraint on possible paths that the universe may take through something called configuration space. Okay. They, so the path, is, the path is Q. Q is a function mapping time time to, you know, some place in configuration space, Q of T. Okay, that's something like that. The point is that they, we were trying to find the right path. So that you have to, it has to satisfy the set of equations. Okay, L is a function of, of several variables. One is the path, one is the velocity along the path, and one is the, is the time. Okay? This is the partial derivative with respect to uh, the, the velocity along the path. This is a function itself is a function of three variables. This doesn't mean anything when applied to a function of three variables. I have to have a function of one variable. So I have to substitute in a particular putative path to do that. Okay? Similarly here, that's a, this, this, is a, this is a subtraction of, this is a function which could not, you could not have this being a, a, a derivative of, okay, as written. Turns out, however, you can write down a, a much more formal but not longer equation, which, do, which does not have this bug, okay, which in fact is type correct and understandable. Okay? That's the, and we did that uniformly throughout mechanics and illustrated with scheme code, which is right one to one correspondence with our with our, our mathematical language, such that you can such that everything is computable. Okay? And I you know, I can just I won't. It dwell on this very much because I mean it was not my intention here to come here and flog a book, um, but the motivation for this book comes from the well. First of all, here here's a great hero. This is this is Isaac Newton's book, but I like the words the natural philosophy, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Unfortunately, in Latin. But here's, a, here's the motivation for this book. In Arnold's book on mechanics, which I was reading about a few years ago, okay, there's this terrible, terrible footnote. Okay? He's, got, he's got this mathematical methods of classical mechanics. And he quotes, he quotes Carl Jacobi, who is an intellectual ancestor of mine, through Marvin Minsky. Okay? Carl Jacobi is writing, in almost all textbooks, even the best, this principle, the principle of least action, is presented so that it is impossible to understand. And then Arnold had the, had the, the gall to, to, to write down, I have not chosen to break with the, the tradition. Okay? And so he, so he was perfectly happy to make it just as hard to understand as uh, Jacobi found it. Okay? He was proud of that. And, and so it really got me angry. So Jack and I, we've done some work on chaos theory, if you want to know, um, and the, we actually did this, wrote a book specifically to, to basically go after people like Arnold. Okay, and here's, by the way, just a, here's an example, a little bit of, of the clarification, exactly what I was saying, by forcing an effective formalization. Consider it in Lagrange's equations, they look like this, from Landau and Lifshitz, it's a traditional book. Okay, but now I'm writing down mathemat for mathematics people. This is not what's in our book. 
this is just explaining to a mathematician what we're doing here. L is a function of the real numbers cross the real numbers to the n cross the real numbers to the n cross the real to the real numbers time a position and a velocity to some number. Okay? What they really mean is that this derivative is zero. Okay? But what that mean? But what are these der- the symbols? The partial derivatives? That's actually never explained. In, in almost any book, including in calculus books, it's all. In fact, Arnold has a quote there. He says, "We are unfortunately must." I can actually. I'll read you Arnold, another quote from Arnold. Gets me. She gets me so mad. <laughs> and, um, where is this? This is in the preface of this book. He says, uh, "It is necessary to use the apparatus of partial derivatives in which even the notation is ambiguous." Quote from V. I. Arnold. Okay. Uh, so I, I got really unhappy about that and figured out what we actually mean by these things. And this is the way what our Lagrange's equations look like in our in our book, okay, where this is the derivative of a function. This is a type type this is correct type you know, safe object, and the, where where this this object is a function of time that produces a triple of the right kind and all that. And I don't want to explain physics to you right now, but that's the reason why we did it. No, it's got the right. Oh, you're worried about how this thing. Uh, yes, you're worried about the fact that there's a parentheses here. Yes, you're right. Okay, the, you could. The, if you, it's got a, there's a there is a precedence rule which unfortunately occurs in in uh, in traditional mathematics. Mathematicians are horrible with respect to notation. Look, you expect little kids to understand like, things like this. Here, cosine square of x equals cosine x times cosine x. Right. Right, we all agree. What's cosine minus one x? <laughs> right. Does that have anything to do with multiplication? I mean, obviously, these people don't give a damn whether anybody understands what they're doing. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, huh? What was this? No, no. Yes. Okay. So, Does this basically mean that everything is clear with parentheses? Well, partly, <laughs> partly, but I, I think I think what I'm really saying is everything is clear. No, because this could be fine if this meant one over cosine, but it doesn't. It means the, the arc cosine, right? This means the inverse of the function cosine, at least in normal most books. That's a terrible thing for people to do. That's just awful. And that the, yeah, this perfectly standard type of stuff that you find in math books all over the place. Obviously, mathematicians really don't care about communicating with each other. Language gone bad. Right. <laughs> and you know, and this is the kind of thing that makes up languages, languages like C as well, or English. I'm a, or English. Yes. Although at least English we're adapted to, to use. Anyway, so I'm going to shut up right now and leave up one of my favorite, one other favorite little quote um, by another hero of mine. And I think with that, I'll just shut up. That's why both artificial intelligence and physics are interesting. They're the two most interesting fields. Okay. Thank you.